I welcome to you this morning, especially if you're new or visiting here at Angadine Congregational Church. Well, I trust you have God's Word opened already to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and we will be finishing up chapter 3 this morning, looking at verses 22 down to 36. Before I begin, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, as we come before your word, we pray that you will please open us, open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, help us to see wondrous things from your word and help us to see our sin um, like a mirror and that you would help us to see the remedy that is found only in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me begin by reading from the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, and verse 30. This is what God's word says. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Have you ever been jealous or envious? No, to be envious is to desire something that you don't have. And jealousy, or and envy, or jealousy, is being afraid that what you have is going to be taken away from you. Now, both envy and jealousy are close cousins, and both rots the bones and affects our Christian testimony. Now, envy and jealousy can rear its ugly head in many different ways. Maybe you can see it in your own lives. You know, we make passive-aggressive comments. We offer unhelpful comments that puts down another person. We make baseless accusations, or we even deliberately sabotage another person's work or reputation. And it comes out in many different ways other than that. And you know what I'm talking about because this happens all around us. It happens in the workplace. You may have been, you know, coming up to a, to a promotion, but instead of you getting the promotion, someone else gets the promotion and envy starts to rot your bones. Or maybe it happens even at school you deserve that award, but then someone else got it. Or about at uni, or even at home, even within families. Envy and jealousy can find its way even in the the most safe of places. And they're perhaps not a safer place than church. Even envy and jealousy can find its way even in the church of God. Jealousy can find its way between church members Some gain some sort of position, and it makes another person jealous. Others may gain a bigger sphere of influence within the church, and they get jealous. And you know what? Even pastors. Pastors can get jealous of other pastors. But it can also happen, if we're not careful, as a church, as a ministry, as Engadine Congregational Church, Jealousy can brew even within our own congregation about other ministries. We can be jealous of other ministries and churches that seem to be thriving and flourishing. We see the church down the road. We hear about churches within our own fellowship or even churches across Australia. We see them flourishing. We see them growing and we become jealous and envious. And if we're not careful, if we don't address this root issue of jealousy and envy, then the fruit of bitterness and division can quickly spring up and destroy relationships and harm our gospel witness. But instead of being jealous or being envious, what we're going to see today is that we are to be the opposite of being jealous and be a people that is full of joy. Because if you're joyful, if you're content, there is no room for jealousy. There is no room for envy. And this was John's attitude. And he says it rightly in verse 29. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and he is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. Well, in our passage, unfortunately, jealousy and envy had gripped the heart of John the Baptist's disciples, and I want us to learn how to deal with jealousy 
and instead learn to be joyful from John the Baptist's response and example. Now in my headings, I've got jealousy rises from verses 22 to 26. Well, let me read verses 22 to 24 just to give us the setting. After this, that is, after his conversation with Nicodemus and after the Passover, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. So Passover week is now over. Jesus and his disciples leave Jerusalem and they head south into the Judean countryside in order for Jesus to spend some time with his disciples and that they would begin to baptize. Now at this point, Jesus had started to amass a great following. Just one chapter ago, in chapter 2, Jesus starts off with just six, right? He starts off with six disciples. They head into Cana. He performs that great miracle. And after that, they head into Jerusalem. Jesus cleanses the temple. And after that, he begins to perform more signs and more wonders, and people are beginning to be drawn to Jesus. And now John the Apostle had shifted his focus away from the Baptist, because he was the focus in chapter 1. He focuses the attention to Jesus, and now John focuses back to the Baptist. But we shouldn't forget that even though Jesus was starting to rise in fame, rise in influence, John the Baptist still had a significant ministry. Remember in chapter 1, people from all over the region were coming to him in the wilderness. He was, if you could make a comparison, um, the first century's John the Baptist. Uh, uh, Billy Graham, sorry. Sorry, this, this is annoying me. Hopefully people in the back can hear me better. Yeah, good. And you'll notice that it's not exactly skin-colored. So... <laughs> There you go. I'm getting a bit more animated because I've got freedom. People from all over the region were coming to him in the wilderness. He was the first century's Billy Graham. People even thought he was the Messiah. Remember all the different claims that people were uh, heaping on him? They thought he was the prophet. They thought he was the Messiah. And so you have these two ministries side by side. You have John preaching the message of repentance and baptizing north of Jerusalem right, in Samaria, in this area called um, Anon, near Salem, that's up in the north. And then you have Jesus and his disciples doing the same in the south. But here we see a problem brewing. Look with me in verse 25. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. Now, we don't know exactly the nature of this debate, but some say that they were arguing whose baptism was more effective, whose baptism was more cleansing, whose baptism was more purifying, purifying. Now, we don't know what came of that discussion, but what we do know is after this conversation, John's disciples came to John and they were complaining. What did they say? Verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. In other words, remember that man, notice how they didn't call him Jesus. They said, remember that man, the man who you called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that man who you testified and gave a glowing recommendation, well, look what that did. He's baptizing everyone. You're the baptizer. I mean, that's your entire brand. You're John the Baptist. And now he's baptizing. And not only that, everyone is going to him. Now, I may have dramatized that a little, but even without the drama, you can see how their response was totally off base. Was everyone going to Jesus? I don't think so, but that's what jealousy does. 
it twists, it obscures, it exaggerates and taints reality. Jealousy had gripped the hearts of John's disciples. Now, how is John going to respond? Is he going to say, all right, let's pick up all the smoke machines we can find. Let's hire the hottest and best Christian band. Let's hire the biggest and best venue and we'll get more people in and we'll get more people to follow us. Is that what he says? I don't think so. Verses 27 to 36, we see John's remedy for jealousy. And by the way, we need to listen to John because he was no slouch. John the Baptist was a great man. He was a gifted man. He was a spirit-empowered man. He was the first prophet to have appeared in the scene in 400 years. And he had the privilege of being the herald of the promised Messiah. In other words, in technical and in high theological terms, he was the bee's knees. If anyone were to be jealous of being kicked from the top, it should have been John. And this is exactly why we need to listen to him. Because if there was anyone who should have been overcome with jealousy, it should have been him. And so I want us to see six things. Six things in his response that if we applied in our lives can help us in our battle against jealousy and envy. And envy. Now these examples are applicable primarily in ministry, but I think it applies in life as well, and you'll see what I mean. So let's start with number one. In verse 27, he says this, To this John replied, A person receives only what is given them from heaven. And my heading for this is, What you have comes from God. What John is saying here is that the ministry that he has comes from God. It didn't come from him. His words, his gifts, his abilities, his success, his influence has been sovereignly given by God to him for the sole purpose of advancing God's eternal plan and decree. Now in the Bible, we see passages like Ephesians chapter 4 or 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where we see that God sovereignly dispenses gifts and offices and talents to his people to achieve his purposes and for his glory. But not only do our gifts come from God, but even the results. And John knew this. Yes, he had a mega following. He had the biggest crowd, but he knew that that came from God. And so when his following started to dwindle and all the people started to follow Jesus, he was satisfied because whether the crowds were big or the crowds were small, he knew they both came from God. No, when we become jealous of other ministers or ministries, which is so easy to do, and even I feel this temptation sometimes. You know, I, I look at our church, and I love my church, but, you know, I, I would be lying if I said that it would have been nice if we had a bit more people. I think this is just a natural temptation that perhaps you face as well. It would be nice, because we get to do more, right? But when we do become jealous, which is so easy to do, sometimes what, that, what happens is we start displaying a sense of discontentment. We become discontent with what God has given to us. Now, there's nothing wrong with desiring good things, desiring better things for God's glory, but more often than not, what is produced is a spirit of discontentment. Now let's apply this in our lives as parents. Do we sometimes feel jealous of other parents? Because they seem to have something that we don't have? Are you jealous of their kids? The way they're performing? The way they're behaving? How about our spouses? Are you jealous of other couples' relationships? Or maybe if you're a single person, are you jealous that other people have, are in a relationship? How about the workplace or in school? This is a very applicable reminder. We can only receive what is given to us from heaven. You see, when we come to understand that everything we have comes from God and that God is sovereign over our promotion, over our demotion, our circumstances, even our talents and Abilities, instead of jealousy and discontentment, joy and contentment is produced. 
And we can say, as the Apostle Paul said, um, in whatever state I am, right? Therewith to be content. So number one, remember, all that you have comes from God. And secondly, know your place. Look with me in verse 28. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. Now, John continues by saying, you know that I have never claimed to be more than who I was. You know that I've never said that I was the Messiah. I've made it very clear, and you can testify of this. I've always said that I was just the one who was sent ahead of him to herald his arrival. I mean, he even says that I'm just the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. John knew that God had given him a task to do. He gave him a very specific calling, specific gifts, specific abilities, a specific ministry, and he wasn't going to pretend like he was anything more than that. Now, you see, sometimes we develop jealousy, bitterness, and animosity in our lives when we start to covet a position that isn't even ours to begin with. Now, in the ministry, this can happen, right? Ministers can just say, look, I'm just a lowly minister, right? I wish I could go and become a conference speaker. I wish I can go and become a, a lecturer at some reputable college. Or I wish I can write more books. Or I, wish I can do all this and do all that. And we start to covet other people's positions without realizing that God has given us a specific task, a specific calling that he has called us into. We need to know our place. But you see, John did not bow to that pressure, right? Despite all the crowds and all the attention and all the success, John knew his place. He wasn't anything more than he thought he was, and he was happy with the role that God had given him, small or large. Number three, not everything is about you. Look at me in verse 29, just that first part. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Now John's going to start to use this illustration of a, a wedding party, and he says something very profound, but very obvious. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom, and not me, and not you. In other words, you are not the star of the show. You are not the center of the universe. Not everything is about you. But you see, in our culture, we worship an idol called self. And we are commanded to bow down to this idol. And when we do bow down to this idol called self, we quickly believe that we are the center of the show. Jealousy causes us to think that we should be the groom. We deserve the attention, we deserve the glory, we deserve the honor. And that fosters a sense of discontentment which leads to jealousy. Now in ministry, pastors are not the bridegroom. Jesus is. This is not my church. This is not your church in the sense that you own the church. This is Christ's church. Now let's not make the mistake that this begins and ends at church. This can happen even in our workplace, right? In our schools, in our families, in our relationships. Is Christ the star of the show in those areas? Or is everything about you? See, John the Baptist, though he was arguably the greatest preacher to have ever lived, knew that what he had was from God. He knew his place and understood that it wasn't about him. He deserved no glory. He deserved no honor. All the glory belongs to the bridegroom, Jesus. Number four, be joyful for others. Second half of verse 29, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. John may not have been the bridegroom, but he held a very special place. He was the friend of the bridegroom. He calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. Have you ever been to a wedding where the, where the best man was jealous of the groom? 
like he had some latent feelings for the, the, the bride. That's awkward. That's awkward. And you can see that, you know, the, the groom is happy, the bride's happy, and here's the best man in the corner, visibly upset and obviously jealous. He's not happy for the groom. He's not joyful. He probably wished that something happened to the, to the groom so he could have the bride for himself. It's a bit awkward. But John the Baptist was the total opposite. He wasn't jealous for someone that wasn't his. Instead, he was the perfect groomsman. He was the one who planned the most perfect bucks party. He was the one who made sure that the venue had all the flowers, probably outshone the the maid of honor. He made sure that he was a gracious host. He made sure that the night before, he made sure that the groom wrote his speech. He made sure everything ran smoothly. And if the groom needed anything, he was right there next beside him. And instead of jealousy, he was filled with excitement and happiness, especially when the groom needed him. What does our passage say? He is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he wasn't threatened. He was full of joy. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. How can you not be joyful? But not only was he filled with joy, he says that, his, that that joy was his and it is now complete. Have you ever had the most satisfying meal? Like after the gym, if you go to the gym, you just go down to, don't judge me, you go down to Macca's and you just eat the most satisfying salad. No, I'm just kidding. And you're your, um, what do you call that, your appetite has been satiated. That's what John is saying. His joy was complete. He was satisfied and he was content. When John learned that not everything was about him and he knew his place, he could be joyful that Jesus was overtaking his own ministry. Why? Because all the glory should go to the bridegroom. It's all about Jesus. And so when we see a minister or a ministry start to grow and overtake our own let's not be passive aggressive let's not say unhelpful words that you know slightly puts him down instead as fellow friends of the groom let's cheer them on let's cheer them on because we're both waiting on the same groom jesus You want to squash jealousy? Be joyful for others. Number five, deflate your tires and exalt Christ. If there's anything you need to take away from this sermon, it's this verse. Because this is the verse that ties this whole passage together. He must become greater and I must become less. Jesus must become greater and I must become less less. This is a necessity. It is necessary that Jesus becomes greater, and it is necessary that I become less. And if you haven't noticed, the first few points that John has been giving us is him decreasing himself. He's been intentionally lowering himself. What what has he said? I only have what I receive from God. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the bridegroom. He's not trying to elevate himself. He's putting himself down, and now he's going to lift Jesus up. And this is intentional. John was glad that his ministry was dwindling, and and Jesus' ministry was flourishing so that he could show to everyone that Jesus must increase. Now I'm reminded of a quote by an 18th century preacher, and I've quoted this before. He says this, Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. That's a nice sentiment. But unfortunately, sometimes we can be too concerned with leaving a legacy, being remembered, making a name for ourselves, and and making ourselves great. Now, don't get me wrong. Ambition is good. Drive is good. Hard work is good. God blesses diligence. 
but good things can be weaponized by our, our flesh, by the devil, by inflating our ego. And we end up chasing the glory of self and not the glory of Christ. The constant drive to become better, to become greater. The competitive drive to do more, to get another promotion, to get into the best church, best school, another speaking engagement, presentation, more evangelistic opportunities, more ministry, or whatever it is. Though they may be good, can quickly inflate our own sense of greatness and our vision of Christ can get lost. And when that happens, our tires get overinflated. And we start to see ourselves at the top. And when we see someone do better than us, jealousy can easily creep into our hearts because then we begin to see ministry and life as, as a race. Like it, there's a podium. Sally is first place. Rob is second place. I'm just third place, and Jesus is nowhere to be seen. But as Christians, there should be no podium. If there is, there should only be one person standing there, and it's Jesus. The more you see of Christ, the less you should see of us. He must increase. I must decrease. J.C. Ryle said, and I quote, every faithful minister must be content to be less thought of by his believing hearers in proportion as they grow in knowledge and faith and see Christ himself more clearly. What a tragedy it would be if someone were to come to our church and say, I came looking for Jesus but all I saw was Roy Arulano. What a tragedy it would be if someone were to come here and said, I wanted to see Jesus, but all I saw was James Stone, Greg Jones. Insert your name. Is Christ big in our ministry? Is Christ big in your marriage? Is Christ big in your careers? Is Christ as big at school, at home? Or has it got you and your own skills, your own giftings, your own intelligence written all over it? And Christ is nowhere to be seen. If you want to deal with jealousy, deflate your tires and exalt Christ. And lastly, remember that Jesus is greater than all. And what I mean by this is that we need to continually remind ourselves that Jesus is not like us. In some charismatic circles, there is this doctrine where they teach that we are little gods, where we possess the same creative power as God so that when we speak things into existence like God did, we can do the same. Now that is a heresy because we minimize who Jesus is. This kind of doctrine elevates our own worth and equates us with God and this stems from an incorrect view of who Jesus is. You know, we're reading the Gospel of John and in it we've learned this glorious truth that the eternal Son of God the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the Word, became flesh. But we must remember that when the Word became flesh, He never gave up His divinity. Jesus took on humanity, yes. He took on a human will, but He was also 100% God. Truly God, truly man. And so from verses 31 to 36, John the Baptist goes on a rousing monologue, reminding his readers just how majestic Jesus is and how different we are, how different he is from Jesus. And he states three things. I'll go through them very briefly. Verse 31, he reminds us to remember where Jesus came from. Look with me in verse 31. 
The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. But the one who comes from heaven is above all. John is saying, I come from the earth. Jesus comes from above. And we need to remember this. The one who comes from heaven is above all. And we are just earthly creatures. Remember where he came from. Number two, his words are God's words, verses 32 to 34. Look at me in verse 32. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. And what John is saying here is that Jesus is greater than all because when Jesus taught, he didn't teach out of the secondhand knowledge. He didn't teach a message that he got from a secondary source. No, he taught a message that he saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears, unlike him. He, John the Baptist, was given a message from God. It was secondhand, but no, Jesus was there. Jesus was there from eternity past. He was there when the, redemp- the plan of redemption and the message of salvation was devised. And the reason why he says this is to stress to us that Jesus is God and I, John, am just a messenger. He must increase, I must decrease. Verse 34, for the one whom God has sent speak the, speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Prophets in the past, John the Baptist, they've all been sent by God. And they've been given the Spirit of God, but their ministries came and went. And the Spirit of God only filled them for specific purposes. But Jesus is greater than all of them because He comes directly from the Father and God gives Him the Spirit without measure and without limit. It's vastly different. In other words, the reason why Jesus must increase and we must decrease is that though we may have a ministry, Jesus is the message. And thirdly, he is the only way to eternal life. John reaches the climax of his exaltation of Christ in verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. I think it was the book of Colossians that tells us that all things were created for him. And one area that God has placed in Jesus' hands is salvation itself. The eternal destiny of every single person. Every single person's future rests on whether they believe in Jesus or not. Verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. You know what John is saying here? He's saying that if you reject me as a person, there's no eternal consequence. John the Baptist is eventually going to meet his demise in the most cruel way. If you reject me, there won't be any eternal consequences. You may hate me, you may not believe me, that's fine, but if you reject Jesus because he is not human, because he is God, there will be eternal consequences. No other person can say that. Abraham, not Moses, not Allah, not Moroni, or any other God, only Jesus. Yes, God showed the greatest expression of love by sending Jesus to a people who hate him, who don't deserve him. And he will give eternal life, eternal joy, eternal satisfaction to those who believe in him and place their faith in him. But God is also a holy God. And he shows it to us here. Because if you reject God and you continue to live your life in opposition to God, you will be judged. That's what the Word of God says. God's wrath and judgment remains on you. We don't have the power to save or condemn, but Jesus does. And that is why He must increase and we must decrease. 
Now you might be wondering, now how does all this information about who Jesus is, about how Jesus is greater than all, how does all this help us with jealousy? Well, firstly, if you're a Christian, remembering that you are just an earthly creature who only receives what they have been given by God, that you are not the star of the show, and remembering that Jesus is above all and greater than all, helps us to see our life and what we have from God's perspective. You know, maybe this morning you've fallen into the trap of thinking that you are the master of your own fate, that you are the captain of your own soul, and that your life and all that you do revolves around you. Maybe you need to repent from pride, discontentment, and murmuring, and deflate your tires and exalt Christ instead. Because ultimately, when we think about the greatness of Jesus, it should give us joy. It should give us satisfaction knowing that we already have the very best thing that anyone could possibly ever have, and that is Jesus Christ himself. And we have eternal life. And remember, eternal life is not so much a duration, but a quality. This eternal life is contrasted with condemnation and judgment and, and perishing. It is a life that is marked by joy and satisfaction and peace. We have that in Jesus. And this is something that no amount of effort, no amount of money can buy. But secondly, if you aren't a Christian, perhaps the jealousy that you experience in your own lives stems from discontentment. And discontentment will tell you that what you have is not enough. And let me tell you, it will never be enough. There will always be a faster car. There will always be a nicer house. There will always be a more exotic location for a holiday. There will always be a better spouse a better child, better parent. There will always be a better something, exciting your senses and chasing pleasure after pleasure will only leave you wanting more. And here's a bit of an oxymoron. It leaves you wanting more but feeling empty at the same time. It's like this never-ending hamster wheel, and it is exhausting it will never be enough. But worst of all, take note of verse 36. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So not only will you come to the end of your life exhausted and dissatisfied, but you will also face the wrath of God for rejecting God's love. So not only will you come to the end of your life just worn out and thinking, what was all of that for? What was the point of breaking my back for 20 years just to pay off this massive mortgage? What was the point of satisfying all my desires only to find that it was all for nothing? But not only that, now I'm facing an eternity without God. I'm facing an eternity separated from God in judgment. Jesus asks a rhetorical question. What good is it if someone gains the whole world and yet forfeits and loses his own soul? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're just exhausted. You're exhausted by trying to please yourself. You're exhausted by the pre- is that the world is trying to put on you that you need to do better, you need to do more, you need to have more. And your heart is just filled with jealousy and discontentment. Well, Jesus offers a better way. He says this in the book of Matthew. He says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. For your souls. 
You know, Jesus ultimately defeats jealousy because those who are followers of Jesus have the very best thing that money cannot buy, Jesus himself. And you will find that Jesus offers true joy, true comfort, true forgiveness, true wealth, true peace, and true satisfaction both now and forevermore. So will you place your faith in Jesus today? Turn away from your sin. Turn away from these empty promises that the world is giving you and turn to Christ and he will give you rest for your souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the rest that we have in you. We thank you that when you came to the world to die for us, a weary world can rejoice. Lord, help us to guard ourselves from jealousy. Help us, Lord, to decrease ourselves and increase Christ in our lives. May he be the object of attention. May he be the park and we are just the signpost. May people see Christ in our lives clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time. Let's all be upstanding. We'll sing one more song. I need thee every hour.